That's what we're here for. So, let's begin again. Let's pray. Lord, we are so grateful that you loved us so much. So much that you gave us, your son, and your instruction to live. Help us to grasp a little bit more how deep and wide your love is and how deeply you want to impact our way of being in this world, preparing us for eternity. In Jesus' name, amen. So, remember Sesame Street? Whether you're nine or you're 90, it's likely that speaking the word Sesame Street calls to your mind some favorite character. Maybe it's Big Bird, or Elmo, or the Count, Oscar the Grouch. <laughs> Remember in each episode you would hear, this episode of Sesame Street is brought to you by the letter, or this episode, Sesame Street, was brought to you by the number, well, this message is brought to you by the word so. Two little letters stuck together that can mean so many, oh, there we go, can mean many different things. So here we are. We are so ready to hear the word of God for the people of God so that we can be filled and ready to meet the challenges of the world that we face as Christ followers in the days ahead. So. That's why we're here. So, so, let's begin. You know, so can be used about eight different ways in the English language. And I personally love the word. If you were to listen to me with your ear tuned to it, you would count the number of occurrences to my embarrassment, I'm sure. It fits almost every aspect of my personality. I use it to buy time, so, and I use it to express my excitement that was so amazing. I use it to be instructive. We do this so that we get the results that we hope for. I use it to check and see if I've understood something so, hot dogs are your favorite thing? But my very favorite way to use the word is to make meaning. And in my mind, in my head, and my heart, I say, so, in light of that understanding, this is what I know, this is what I think, this is what I feel, because of this, then that. And in that way, so is a very spiritual word. If you understand spirituality to be making meaning, you may have heard me say that out loud, that spirituality is about making meaning. All of the hundreds of hours of coursework, all of the thousands of tuition dollars, all of the endless hours of research in the library and writing to explore human understanding of spirituality and spiritual formation can be summed up in two core ideas. Spirituality is about meaning making and you can't not be spiritually formed. That's it. You, me, the guy out there walking the streets of Layton or New York City, we're all being spiritually formed. For better or for worse, what happens to you, no matter how nonsensical it may seem, is making you who you are and you're doing the best you can to respond to it. And if you're not responding to it, you're reacting to it. 
but whatever you're doing, you're making meaning. Now, Christian spiritual formation, on the other hand, is different. Christian spiritual formation has some rules of engagement. And Christian spiritual formation has an end goal of Christ-likeness. And in the end, unity with Christ, so that we might be present with God in perfect harmony for all eternity. And in this passage that we're looking at today, from Ephesians chapter 4, Paul has set his intention of helping us to understand what Christian formation into maturity is and what it isn't. So Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit as he writes this letter, is a master teacher. And he knows that we learn from comparison and contrast. And in this passage, he is contrasting the Ephesians' former life with their new life in Christ. And in the process, he's helping them to understand how to grow into spiritual maturity. The kind of spiritual maturity he describes in the first 16 verses of chapter 4 that we looked at last week. But he's also describing the human condition. And so the Ephesian humans are not a whole lot different from the American humans or the Canadian humans and or the Laytonians. In other words, when we talk about the message of our friend Paul, catch this, you guys, our friend Paul, this bud is for you. Across cultures. Across time. Paul is our friend And he's our companion in spiritual formation, coming to maturity in our faith. And because today's message is brought to you by the word, so, I'm going to read a little bit of the previous passage before I put this passage on screen. And this is what Paul said. Paul said, Christ gave him, Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature attaining the whole measure of the fullness of Christ, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every way the mature body of him who is the head. That is Christ. And from him, the whole body joined together and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. And we've experienced that this morning, haven't we? Each part doing its work. Now for the scripture. So, verse 17. So I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, catch this, due to the hardening of their hearts. And having lost all sensitivity, They have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity with a continual lust for more. You, however, did not come to know Christ in that way. Surely you heard of him 
And we're taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, and to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, therefore, or because of this, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbor, for we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. And this comes from Psalm, Psalm 4. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. He who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with his own hands, that he may have something to share with those in need. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ in God, in Christ God forgave you. We can go home now. Once again, in this passage, yes, ma'am. That is the New International Version. And once again, in this passage, there's something in every verse that merits a sermon in and of itself, right? Right? And I don't want to fall into the trap of saying, here's your list of what a Christian should and shouldn't do. And I also don't want to communicate a too big a picture that says, be a moral person and God will be happy with you. Instead, I want to say, if you do your homework, if you reflect on this passage, God will reveal to you where in your journey you need to go. And if you look on these words and you ask God to show you what you should work on this week, God will let you know. And if you ask God to teach you about the attitudes that go along with each of these actions and to purify your mind and your heart as you reflect on these things, God will be faithful to you to make you holy as God is holy which is his commandment. But I'm going to insert something here. If you're expecting a Sunday service to do the work of spiritual formation in your life every day, you're going to be sorely disappointed. Because while worshiping together is important, teacher says you're never going to grow unless you do your homework. Take that as a back-to-school reminder. Meditate on this passage. So, take it for what it's worth. Back to the message at hand. I'm going to go back to verse 17. Because this is a really good place to start this. So, I tell you this, and I insist on it in the Lord that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do, and this is the part I want to focus on, in the futility of their thinking. Have you ever had a black cat or a white dog or known somebody who did? Well, futility, futility is thinking that you can keep a black cat or a white dog in your home and not have pet hair stuck to your clothes. (laughs) 
especially if that cat or dog, I've noticed, is short hair. Because those tiny little hairs, they get into your upholstery and into the fibers of your clothing and into your rugs or your carpets. And as soon as you get rid of them, you know what happens. They reappear. They come back. We had a Jack Russell named Clive who hasn't lived with us since 2013. But I'm pretty sure that if I pulled Ken's navy blue pea coat out of storage, we'd still find traces of Clive. And this futility of thinking that Paul is talking about, it is a lot like that. It's persistent. It hangs around even when you're trying to get rid of it actively. And thinking that you can have a hair-free life when you love a short-haired pet is futile. And Paul insists in the Lord that if you're going to live a Christ-like life, you got to get the dog off your lap. Because holding the dog is only going to get you more and more covered with fur. Yes? So that's a folksy example. But what Paul's talking about is actually deeper and darker than that. See, feudal thinking, the kind of feudal thinking that he is speaking of, feudal thinking feeds itself. And it creates a monster. And that monster becomes a master that keeps us from gazing on the goodness of God. Darkens our hearts. It twists our understanding and it desensitizes us so that it takes more and more and more of our sensitivity to the things of God. And it deceives us into believing that the way we see things right now, our perceptions of the present, are reality. And that monster that it creates, this futile thinking, it screams, feed me! Feed me! Well, it is less and less satisfied. And in Paul's words, having lost all sensitivity... They've given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity. And they're full of greed. Now that word sensuality, it tends to get confused in our minds with sexuality or at the very least bodily pleasure. And while that may be a part of sensuality, the word in Greek is much more than that. The word is aselgia. You want to say it with me? Aselgia. It's a breakdown of restraint. It's doing my thing, my way, in my time, at my pleasure, because I want to, because I can, because I have a right to, because I am my own God. Aselgia. Now, the problem with that monster, your monster, is that it will never be satisfied. It will ride you and it will beat you and it will compel you to find more. More pleasure, more excitement, more chemical high, whether that comes from a substance or whether it comes from your own body chemistry. And satisfying the monster of aselgia is futile. It always wants more space in your head, more of your time, more of your resources, more of your loyalty. And pretty soon, because of the darkness, because of the loss of sensitivity, that monster is not your lapdog. You are its lapdog, and you belong to it. 
Let me give you a real life kind of example over time. Dating apps. Do you remember dating apps? The dating apps like Match.com or eHarmony. And when Match.com came out, it was basically a way to meet someone who might be a good romantic partner. It was a way to maybe get to know somebody who would even be with you for life. And lots of folks found someone to meet and to get to know and to love. One of my best friends married her, friend, married her best friend <laughs> through Match.com. Today's dating apps, like Tinder, a few short years later, are a lot less relational, promising much more excitement, much less commitment, just swipe again and again. Some of you probably don't even know about Tinder, but some of you do. And even more than that, then there are the apps that promote relationshiplessness. Say that with me twice, relationshiplessness. Something like the popular OnlyFans that monetizes content to, quote, satisfy fantasies or desires, explore new experiences, or relieve boredom, unquote. And this is a Celgia. You better not be on our nap. <laughs> a Celgia, a soul-sucking, desensitizing, technology-assisted sensuality that spiritually forms or deforms its users, seeking something that cannot be meaningfully satisfied. And that is futility of thinking. Lots of thinking and lots of futility. Trying to satisfy fantasies or desires, explore new experiences, or relieve boredom. And this is what Paul says to the Ephesians in verse 20. This is not the way of life you learned. When you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. This is God's plan for us. This is not Paul the buzz killer or Jesus the killjoy. The spiritual formation that God wants to do in you and in me leads to peace. Deep, meaning-filled peace. Shalom in the Hebrew. Shalom is balanced. Shalom is the unity of the body and the mind and the spirit and the soul, all the aspects of our humanity brought into harmony with God, with our brothers and sisters, with the earth and with heaven. It is not futile thinking. It is not wishful thinking. It is hope-filled thinking because we are rooted and grounded in love through the giver of hope who conquered both spiritual and physical death in his resurrection. That is our Jesus, our Savior. See, Shalom and Aselgia, they can't live together. 
they have mutually exclusive realities. Asalgia undermines and destroys all the conditions that are necessary for shalom. It destroys moral integrity, justice. It destroys right relationships. And the pursuit of meaning-packed shalom requires the rejection of feudal thinking. Shalom thrives in environments where righteousness and peace and moral restraint are upheld. And it dies where there is feudal thinking. So make no mistake, folks. We are being spiritually formed or malformed by our attitudes and by our actions. And some actions Paul mentions in this passage, and you can see them, some lead to the death of your spirit. And some lead to life and growth and Christ-likeness. So, 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 what's your choice today? What's your goal? Aselgia or shalom? Death or life of your spirit? And what meaning will you make of your life? Is it a journey towards my way or God's way? Will you choose? Will you choose hope or hell on earth? And what are you going to do with your thinking? Are you going to think with futility? Or with hope. See, the way of Christ, as Paul has previously shared with us in the rest of the book of Ephesians, it's open to all. It is open to every single human being ever born. But maturity in faith, that's not a given. It's a choice to put down the dog can't have it both ways. You can't have a spotless coat and a Jack Russell Terrier in your lap. But, Pastor, you say, I love my dog. I know, I love my dog too. I even love Clive still. And that's where the analogy really falls short. Because God doesn't expect you to quit loving your dog or quit holding and petting your dog just because he sheds. But in truth, the choices are harder than that. As much as it might hurt you to put down your dog, and I don't mean, you know what I mean, take your dog off your lap. (laughs) As much as uh, that's a hard choice, the choices that Paul is talking about are more like this. Will you choose forgiveness instead of getting back? Retribution. Will you choose truth rather than cover up? Will you choose words that build up instead of those that put down? Will you choose conflict conflict resolution rather than being enraged? Will you use your anger to resolve wrong instead of allowing it to take you to bitterness? Will you be sensitive to God instead of building another wall between you and him because you don't like what he says? Will you choose to let God's word dwell in you richly now and later instead of skimming over the top of scripture? Looking for your favorite parts? Will you submit your own values to God's values? Will you let God's way become your way over time? 
Will you stop feeding that insatiable monster of self and live in humility and in submission to God? We're all being formed spiritually for good or not. But real life in Christ answers all those questions on God's side. What one monk called the practice of the presence of God in everyday life. And this is the monotony of dis disciplined Christian living. Instead of being tossed to and fro by every wave that comes along, by every wind but this is God's way to peace and to maturity. So, 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 let's pray together. Lord God, there are passages that um, we don't necessarily want to read the details to. These are the places that meddle in our lives, telling us how to live. But today, Lord, we thank you that you do tell us how to live, that you do tell us how to grow, that you do tell us how to become mature that you do walk with us into what you have called us to, this high calling. You don't leave us on our own to figure it out. You've given us many, many tools, and we thank you for that. Now, Lord, we ask that you would help us. Help us, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, stand for a blessing. I don't know what your week is going to look like. I don't know what my week is going to look like. But I know that God will go with you. That he will be present with you. And so, may you respond to the leading of the Holy Spirit to deal with the issues that you face every day of the week, knowing that God loves you and that his love is deep and wide and high and holds you firm. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.